Welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. We aim to bring you the best macro analysis to help you successfully invest in financial markets. For our latest analysis, visit macrohive.com. This is the year of central banks hiking rates and surging bond yields. We're covering this from all possible angles. We have regular updates from our star US economist, Dominique dwarf who's been calling for the Fed to raise rates to a whopping 8%. We have our weekly recession model, which spits out the probability of a U.S. recession. And we continue to educate our members with our latest explainer, where we run through what concepts like duration and convexity mean in bond finance. Aside from that, we've ramped up our work on equities with regular updates on U.S. earnings, including the shocking Netflix miss that we saw a few days ago. Finally, we continue to offer sensible and robust research on crypto markets. This week, we look at why Ethereum volatility has been falling. And I'd urge you to come to MacroHive if you want to avoid fake research and outlandish predictions that you see on other forums like Twitter, YouTube, Discord, and Reddit. To get access to all of these insights, simply become a member at macrohive.com. With membership, you can get access to all of our updates, analysis, webinars, transcripts, and our member Slack room, where you can interact with the MacroHive research team and other members all hours of the day. Membership to MacroHive costs the same as a few weekly cappuccinos, so go to macrohive.com to sign up now. And if you're a professional or institutional investor, we have a more high-octane product that features all of my and the MacroHive research team's views, our model portfolio, trade ideas, machine learning models, and much, much more. Hit me up on Bloomberg or email me on bilal at macrohive.com. That's bilal, B-I-L-A-L at macrohive.com to find out more. Now onto this episode's guest, John Butler. John is a commodity and gold guru, amongst other things. He has 25 years experience in international finance. He served as a managing director for various bulge bracket investment banks on both sides of the Atlantic, research, strategy, asset allocation, and product development roles, including Deutsche Bank and Lehman's. He's advised some of the world's largest institutional and private investors in matters ranging from wealth preservation to enhancing returns through a wide variety of innovative strategies. He's also been ranked number one investment strategist by Institutional Investor Magazine. He's also written a number of books, including The Golden Revolution and The Golden Revolution Revisited. Now onto the podcast. Greetings, John. It's great to have you back. I think the last time we spoke on the podcast, it must have been over a year ago, I think it was. Yes, I I think it was. I think it was prior to most, if not all, of the major events and surprises we've had more recently. Yeah. And I recall from that conversation, your big theme that you were pushing very articulately and very clearly was that we're entering an era or phase of stagflation with echoes of what we had in the 1970s. And it appears that a lot of what you said has, has panned out. But in your own words, I mean, how would you characterize what we've seen in, in recent months or in fact, the past, say, six to 12 months? I think I created a good framework for understanding the situation that we've ended up in. I mean, history repeats rather than rhymes, so I don't want to suggest that I I was in any way able to predict the specifics of what's going on. And yet the framework, I think, was a helpful one. And basically, it came down to this, is that when we entered our COVID lockdown world, I saw it as a self-imposed negative supply shock that is shutting down, at least partially and at least temporarily, all kinds of key supply chains in ways that, that anyone couldn't really couldn't really see, couldn't really forecast, couldn't really grapple what the ultimate effects of those policies were going to be. Yet I just knew, and and to be fair, look, there's a little bit of instinct in all of these things, right? I just felt I had a bit of gut instinct that the overall negative supply shock impact of this was going to be far higher than people were, were, were thinking because they just had no experience of it. The 70s were a long time ago. People have short memories. Even I, of course, struggled to remember the 1970s, but I, you know, I was alive. And I do remember a few things like waiting in long gasoline lines in California when they imposed rationing. And you know, that creates a real impression on a, on a young person. In any event, the COVID part, I thought I got pretty well because you had to combine this negative supply shock, which I thought people were underestimating, with the huge demand support. And so in classic monetarist, Friedman-esque fashion, We were having more money, chasing fewer goods. We were misallocating resources. And that was a very, very stagflationary mix, in my opinion. But no, I hardly foresaw what's happened more recently with China re-entering lockdowns, at least temporarily, 
obviously the Ukraine war not only kicking off, but becoming now, sadly, what looks like might be a prolonged conflict, which seriously mucks up all manner of things, fertilizer, agriculture, chemicals, and of course, transportation throughout that region of all of the above and everything else. It's a real mess now. And so it's an order of magnitude larger than I would have expected at this point. And on the Ukraine-Russia situation, you alluded to some of the markets that are being affected by it. But you know, can you give us a bit more detail about how you think this is magnifying everything? The problem is that prices are set at the margin. So let's say you have a supply shock, which affects, I don't know, 10% of global output, 20% of global output, whatever, of some critical, important input into you know, all kinds of things. And again, there are so many that are affected now fertilizer being in the front row practically. But then if you get just another 2% or another 1%, because you're approaching the margin where the supply elasticity and demand elasticity and whatnot, you know, all that stuff that goes into the micro of pricing in real time and space, you start to get exponential effects in price. And that's where we've got to now. And I, I think that's the only way you can begin to understand why producer price inflation in Germany is now over 30% year over year. It's hard for us, having lived through such a prolonged period of generally low and stable prices, to even begin to contemplate how on earth, in such a short period of time, you go from essentially price stability to 30% year over year. That can only be explained through the non-linear effects of having basically sailed too close to the wind or got too close to the margin uh, around critical, critical uh, markets. And there is a lot of talk about various players in the world led by the US in different ways to try to make up for the impediments on, on the supply side, whether it's the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve releases, Obviously, the U.S. is a big ag producer. So is there enough spare capacity, so to speak, globally, where authorities like or countries like the U.S. could activate them to make up for the shortfall that we're seeing in, in Russia and Ukraine? I don't believe there is the spare capacity that there used to be. Remember, remember for a long time, back in the heyday of China, India, and other emerging markets pursuing blatantly mercantilist growth policies of maintaining weak currencies, you know, ex export-led growth, accumulating capital and reserves from the rest of the world, and so on and so forth. They've come a long way now, and their populations require, and this is just this is the social dynamic at play here, their populations require some sort of participation in all the progress that they've made economically through the decades. And what that means for your average worker, your average household, is that they can now demand with some success higher wages as a result of their higher productivity right you know you've mixed a lot more capital per worker in that part of the world over the past generation and that does create potential for the workers to benefit and they should benefit and so i think the idea now that these countries simply continue to pass along deflationary forces through their manufacturing growth automatically, that's not so true anymore. And so I think that what happened through the years is that all the spare capacity and the perception that your typical emerging market worker would continue to accept living hand to mouth, even when they were operating cutting edge machinery, that just wasn't realistic. It wasn't going to continue forever, and it hasn't. And so I think that's kind of what has resulted in this shock being as large uh, as it has been in price terms, because you just don't have the same flexibility amongst your emerging market labor force today that you did you know, 30 or 40 years ago. And you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is the parallels and also the differences to the 1970s. And two differences you know, I think seem to be important. Now, one is that workers had more bargaining power back in the 70s due to unions and uh, other such structures. And we don't really have that today. It still seems like, although people say the labor market tight and so on, there isn't really this kind of collective union type structures or 
or these sorts of uh, sort of worker cartels of different kinds. So it still feels like the microstructure of the the business world still leads to power being in the hold of the employers rather than employees. So that's one thing I'm thinking is that different to the 70s. And then the other one is just the rise of financial markets. You know, financial markets today are much much bigger than they were in the 70s. So you have this outlet for inflation to run off into the financial markets rather than in the real economy. I mean, what what do you think about those two potential differences to the 70s? I think they're both correct observations, Bilal, but what I said a moment ago about the typical emerging market manufacturer now expecting higher wages as a result of dramatic increases in, in local productivity, I think that largely, if not completely, offsets what you're talking about regarding the deunionization in the developed world. Look, there are there are consequences, good and bad, of shifting your manufacturing base to other countries. You can benefit for some period of time from lower import costs, although that won't last forever as the standard of living gaps eventually longer term have to close. But yes, uh, there are there can be certain benefits from that. But we've come a long way, as I mentioned. And then regarding the outlet into financial markets, you're absolutely right. But didn't we go through you know, over a decade of really, really rampant asset price inflation coming out of the shock of 2008-2009? So that was going on. And the colossal amounts of of money printing and public debt expenditure and spending and so on and so forth that took place during that time got bottled up in asset prices for sure. I mean, how else do you explain zero or negative bond yields? How else do you explain price earnings multiples that are in, you know, not just the double digits, but I mean, in some cases, you know, well into the 20s, you know, well out of line with historical comparisons with you know, obviously a couple exceptions like the peak of the 1929 bubble or the peak of the 2000 bubble and so on. So that that does help to explain these things, but we've come through that now in my opinion, asset price uh, multiples and whatnot are at levels that are are in my opinion simply not sustainable, especially if you start to become a bit risk averse and we've had some events over the past couple of years, covid, war, uh, <laughs> etc some political also some political earthquakes uh, occurring closer to home that that definitely i think have the potential to raise the risk aversion perception in markets quite dramatically well we'll come back to the politics uh, later on but on the inflation side i mean what do you think about central banks it, it does seem like they have pivoted at least the fed has they're in some ways the the leader of the pack in terms of setting the tone they've gone from being very dovish focusing on transitory now they're talking about inflation being the biggest problem there's talk of 50 basis point hikes by the Fed, multiple you know, hikes of, of that nature, some talk of 75 basis points. So, I mean, what, what's your take on the, on the Fed right now? Well, the Fed is under more public scrutiny today than it's been since the early 1980s, obviously. It, I think that's qu- pretty clear now. And so the idea that they could just keep on doing what they were doing, I think, is really not plausible. First of all, let's face it, they got things badly wrong. They really went all in, at least temporarily, on this idea that inflation was going to be transitory and that it was going to be pretty, pretty low. So nevertheless, that was obviously wrong. And, and so they, you know, they burned through some credibility by getting that as blatantly wrong as they did. And so at a minimum, they have to admit that, and they kind of have. And I mean, obviously they're, they're blaming external factors and shocks as policymakers tend to do in that situation, but there's, it's not possible for them to completely escape some sense of just having been clueless about what's happened. And so that's a problem. But the the other problem is at some point you need to start to choose whether you're really going to position yourself for the longer term as a credible institution or whether you're going to kind of burn through what remaining credibility you have without addressing the mistakes you've already made. And, And clearly there has been a reassessment along those lines at the most senior levels. And it's not just the Fed, but as you say, they might be in the lead, but it's beginning to happen at, at the Bank of England to a lesser extent. It's beginning even to happen around the margins uh, at the ECB, although they have a far more complicated situation for you know, reasons we can get into when we get into the politics. So I do think we're going to go through this hawkish moment, and I call it a moment. We're going to go through a hawkish moment when central banks are going to see just how much hawkish rhetoric and policy action they can get away with before they are staring yet another potentially large financial crisis in the face as a result of how over-leveraged, over-indebted markets tend to resort to long, long periods of excess liquidity when that liquidity is suddenly shut off. So they're going to, to try to do what they can do. Now, this is a very difficult job. I don't think they can pull it off without some sort of accident, as people say. 
And the metaphor I like to use, well, actually, it's a mixed metaphor. I like to say that the Fed and other central banks, as a result of past policy actions, have effectively been walking backwards on a tightrope into a corner. That is, it's been a balance. <laughs> it's been a balancing act. It's been a delicate balancing act the entire time, and yet the way in which they've done it, in my opinion, has only backed them further into a corner. Nobody likes to be in that situation, and so I do think it's the hawkish moment, as it were, will only be short-lived before they blink and try once again to see if they can find a way to rescue a system. Without reigniting or reflating, I should say, another bubble. And how high do you think bond yields could go? I mean, in a way, in nominal terms, the sky is the limit. If, if inflation keeps rising, now that said, we've come a long way. I think it's difficult to see inflation rising too much farther from here before the momentum slows down. I, I mentioned a moment ago that you know, producer prices in Germany have soared to over thirty percent year on year, and obviously some of that's going to get passed through, but not all of it is. So I think that. Probably there's limited scope uh, for nominal bond yields to reach those sorts of levels. I don't think we're going to see that. Uh, however, I do think they can get higher from here temporarily, but only temporarily if we start going through this hawkish moment. And and that really just comes down to yield curve dynamics, right? You just run the numbers, you run the math. And as long as central banks look like they're going to do something somewhat decisive in the short term, the long end's not going to be able to rise a whole lot. But when you're talking about the two-year yield, if central banks start to get religious, there might be a couple more percentage points to run at the short end. But I'm not sure the long end's going to respond by much, if at all. You talk about this financial accident. I mean, what, one thing many people have been talking about, and this is obviously the the classic error or thing that people will come back to, but they argue that this time's different <laughs> because you know household balance sheets appear to be healthier than before. You know, bank balance sheets are healthier as well. So if you look at stretched balance sheets, you know, it looks like government balance sheets are the ones where there's probably most leverage. You could say. So, so when you hear that, what do you think in the context of a potential accident? It is a legacy of 2008, 2009, that the public sector in various ways effectively assumed a lot of the leverage that had previously existed on private sector balance sheets. And that's true of financials, it's true of corporations, and it's true of households, all in varying degrees. The problem is, though, is that the collective pile of leverage, debt and leverage, public and private, relative to income is higher today. So you've created and the system has still grown. And you could say, oh, but you know, the government side or the public side is, is basically risk free. So there's nothing to worry about there. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't tell me on the one hand that central banks have got to come to terms with inflation. And then on the other hand, the public sector is not going to have its finances impacted by that. And so I think the, the risk here could be actually this time around, somewhat on the public side. That is that government financing costs really begin to soar. And the only way to then deal with that might be fresh discussion of tax rises. Well, that's not exactly going to uh, go over well when it comes to financial asset valuations, if people start pushing for higher taxes as we're pummeling into a stagflationary recession. And that could lead to a negative shock. So I, I think there's many ways in which it could happen. But the fact is that the leverage is there, the debt is there. It's kind of a shell game, right? You, know, you can move the marble from you know one place to another, but if the marble keeps growing in size, at some point, the shell is not going to be big enough to cover it up anymore. People will notice that, and that game will be over. Within this all, many people have, again, talked about super cycles and commodities. So if there is one market that could continue to go up, you, one could make the case that commodities is that. And I remember the last time we spoke, I think you had some doubts about the whole super cycle thesis. How, how do you see that now? Well, I think the, the concept of a super cycle ultimately is one that is growth driven and demand driven rather than inflation driven and supply shock driven. This one is more the latter. I wouldn't really characterize it as a super cycle. And I also thought the original big super cycle from the 90s and 2000s was somewhat overplayed, that people gave a bit too much credit to the demand side only, and they didn't pay as much attention as they might have done to the fact that the supply side was actually pretty good at keeping up with the growing demand. And the reason why prices were rising actually had more to do with, with just inflation than it did with growth, even in that case, even in that case. 
But today, I think it's even more obvious that what's happening is is less a demand driven super cycle of, of real growth and more just, again, the, the stagflationary effects uh, that we're seeing due to a result of negative supply shocks, which originally were COVID related, but now they seem related to a number of things and lots of artificial demand being thrown at the problem, uh, resulting in simply a higher price level. And where, where does gold fit into all of this? Because gold, in this environment where you see inflation, whether it's CPI, PPI, whichever measure of inflation you look at, shooting higher, one would have thought gold would be much, much higher, but it hasn't gone up as much as many people thought. I mean, how, how do you think about the dynamics of gold? I, I think there's two reasons why it hasn't moved by more. The first is the dollar itself has been strong. And other factors equal gold struggles to rise in dollar terms in a dollar strength environment. If you look at gold in currency basket terms, it's actually done all right. Uh, but the dollar has been very, very strong. And so that that's part of the explanation. I, I don't think that's sustainable, by the way. The amount of dollar strength we're seeing, I don't think is going to continue. Then there is the issue of risk aversion. While we have obviously seen risk aversion tick up, we've, we've seen it in bond markets, we've seen it in equity markets. In a historical comparison, it's still not particularly high. And I think for gold to get a real kick higher from here, we're going to need to see we're going to need to see equity markets telling you that the consequences of covid lockdowns and negative supply shocks the consequences of the war in ukraine the consequences of populist politics in much of the world are going to be much more severe and prolonged in terms of their impact on corporate profitability and I, if that begins to happen and you you're, you're still in this stagflationary environment and yet you're concerned about corporate profits Investors have to start looking for a place to hide. How do you protect yourself against the inflation while still reducing your allocation to equities? And there's only one real answer to that, real ultimate answer to that, and that's gold. And that's one reason, of course, why gold did so well in the 70s. So notwithstanding many things being different today than they were in the 1970s, gold can get propelled dramatically higher, in my opinion, in that sort of environment, as indeed it was during the 1970s. And you mentioned you're skeptical of this recent dollar strength lasting. Why do you think the dollar isn't in some kind of multi or uptrend? I think there's this perception, which is partly correct, but I just think it's overplayed that the United States still has all of these unique advantages. There's a war now in Eastern Europe and you know, North America is a long way from there. Uh, the US is less energy dependent than much of the rest of the world on imports because it produces so much domestically. So you're seeing the yen get absolutely hammered by what's becoming a global energy crisis. You're seeing Germany get absolutely hammered by perceptions that it's going to be cut off from Russian gas. The, the U.S. can claim that it has, and, and investors in, you know, in the U.S. can claim that the risks there of disruptions are therefore much, much lower. And, and, and I do believe that's true. But what I'm saying is, I think it was pretty much already priced in. I believe the U.S. has already enjoyed this premium of greater self-sufficiency in energy, in food, in a lot of the things that are being affected by this series of unfortunate events that we've been going through. So I just think it's already in the price, as it were. So it's really more about that than about denying that that fundamental perception is, in fact, correct to a large extent. And what do you make of the sanctioning of Russian reserves in terms of the fate of the dollar? Well, this, <laughs> this is really opening Pandora's box. Choose your metaphor, but I think the United States is playing an increasingly dangerous game by, on the one hand, weaponizing the dollar through general sanctions on you know, trade and whatnot. And on the other hand, now basically trying to outright freeze and confiscate Russia's reserves. I mean, that's really, really one farther step potentially into the unknown. And at that point, this is what I say about it, again, to mix metaphors. The U.S. outright freezing, possibly confiscating Russia's foreign exchange reserves is a shot across the bow to other aspirant countries in the world, such as China and India, but also, therefore, a shot in the United States' own foot because the U.S. is so dependent on foreign financing to run its twin deficits. And so China and India and others 
no doubt are working on this one, thinking, okay, what if it happens to us someday? We need to be prepared. Do we still want to be holding a lot of dollar reserves? Maybe not. Perhaps we should slow our accumulation thereof. Well, okay, if you're going to slow your accumulation of dollar reserves, but you're still a net exporter, then you're going to have to start shifting some of that stuff around. I mean, that's going to reduce the demand function for dollars. That's going to put upward pressure on dollar interest rates. And is that really what the United States wants? So I think this is a very dangerous game to play. But the United States, I guess, has chosen that the conflict in Ukraine and the more general geopolitical rivalry with Russia in Syria, all around the Black Sea region, all around the Baltic, Maybe they've just decided that this is you know, something that is so important they've got to go there. But it's a very dangerous game to play. Do you think, I mean, some people talk about crypto being a potential alternative to the dollar in, in this context of reserve confiscation and so on, and more generally as a refuge in a crisis period? I, I think from the perspective of an individual investor, it's certainly worth considering digital assets. But if you are a nation state, a physical entity, looking to trade in physical resources with other nation states, and you want to be able to conduct that in a way that is going to maximize trust, maximize credibility, and is going to, therefore, give you the greatest possible freedom of action from any possible sanctions or other policies that will be implemented electronically through the banking system. You really do want to try and implement something which is tried and tested and known to work throughout history. And that's to rely on gold, right? That's to rely on something physical or simply barter, you know, trade in kind, agree a gas oil exchange rate, as it were, to be able to trade oil for gas or gas for oil. Or what about food? Agree a rate at which you're going to exchange wheat for oil or, or whatever it might be. Now, obviously, barter is hugely cumbersome, but that's where gold comes in. Gold is an ideal medium of exchange for that sort of thing if you decide you want to base your trade in a currency, in a medium of exchange, as it were, which cannot be manipulated by any one country as an instrument of financial sanctions or other economic warfare. And it's no surprise to me that this discussion has already kicked off. I mean, there have been multiple reports coming out of Russia, China, India, Turkey, and a few other places that there are people working on how they could perhaps rely a little bit more on gold for cross-border trade and a little bit less on the dollar and other national fiat currencies generally. Underlying all of this is this undercurrent of huge political changes, and we've kind of touched on, on some of that. If you kind of step back, is there a way of bringing it all together? We've got this Russia-Ukraine thing kicking off. There's obviously the rise of China and India with their own ways of doing things. You have this race for energy or commodity independence from, from each other. There's polarization in the US and other parts of, of the world. I mean, there's so much going on, it seems, as the reaction against all the COVID policies that we've had over the last couple of years. How do you look at all of this at a more systemic level? Well, as the Chinese curse goes, may you live in interesting times. This is not paint a pretty picture. I mean, as you just describe it, it's almost as if we're heading into yet another round of global resource wars going from being cold resource wars to being hot resource wars, as happened in 1914 and has happened in 1939. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there were all kinds of other political factors at play, but it's not lost on most historians of the 20th century that both world wars had very, very specific geopolitical rivalries around access to critical natural resources, coal, steel, oil, and also the various transportation choke points around the world. What was the 1939 one? Because 1914... It was kind of the great game, I guess. But 1939, what was the big resource element of that? The problem was that because of the dismemberment of Germany following the First World War and also the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, they no longer had an easily accessible land bridge to the oil fields through the Balkans into the Middle East. They no longer had that. And so they were going to have to somehow acquire natural resources through very, very significant territorial acquisitions. And so they head into North Africa, they head into the Caucasus region. And so that, in my opinion, it really is a push for the oil fields, a push for the Suez Canal, which of course would help to transport the oil back to Europe. I'm pretty sure that was a part of it. And keep in mind that within the German high command, 
one of the biggest disputes with Hitler early on in the conduct in the conduct of the war was already in 1942 when they started to say, look, we're not spending enough resources getting to the oil. We're trying to accomplish too many things at once. And Hitler never was fully convinced of that, but he did redirect some of the Germans' military resources to those attempts to get to the oil-producing regions and the Suez Canal to bring the oil home. So that's really interesting context. I mean, that's probably a side of the Second World War we probably don't learn enough about, at least at school, you know, where most of us learn these sorts of things, but it's, it's fascinating. So in some ways, there's parallels to that. There's this global resource war. And could this get as serious as, as a world war? Well, God, I hope not. But this is the most serious things have been for a long time. Look, I don't want to catastrophize here or anything like that. But Russia, in my opinion, would not be doing what they are doing unless they thought that there was a mortal threat posed here by Ukraine potentially joining NATO. If you take a look at a map, you can sort of understand why they're so concerned. And indeed, we just discussed the Second World War. It's not lost on the Russian military that the bulk of the German army passed through Ukraine on its way to Stalingrad and trying to get onto the oil fields. But also a significant portion of that army then also went northwards towards Moscow to try and decapitate the Russian leadership at the time. And the idea that they're going to let Ukraine join NATO, I think, is an absolute non-starter. I, I think we mentioned on a, on a call two years ago, maybe now, but Bilal, when I offered my opinion regarding the unrest in Belarus. And I, and I said, if the government in Belarus falls, Russia is also going to go in and set up their own puppet government again. I don't think Russia will allow Ukraine or Belarus to become NATO members or de facto NATO controlled states. They just won't do it. And so having made that clear, it does concern me that NATO is still pushing this one as hard as they are. So leave aside the good guys, bad guys narrative. I don't think it's helpful here. If you simply want to form an opinion about whether an escalation of this conflict uh, to a global level is likely or not likely, I think you have to conclude it, it's increasingly likely, uh, regardless of who are the good guys and the bad guys here. So that needs to be appreciated, I think, by all, all observers of the conflict. And then more generally, if we situate this in terms of some of the polarization we're seeing in, in uh, Western countries, what do you think behind some of that and the, the aftershocks of COVID? That also seems to be leading to contexts where you could have more unrest in liberal Western democracies where the, you know, this type of stuff isn't supposed to happen. Well, this is what I'm most afraid of. I'm afraid that what's happened post-2008 is, and, and this, you know, there's, there's good evidence to show that inequality, normally as measured by the Gini coefficient, while it has been trending higher for quite a long time, it really accelerated post-2008 in much of the developed world. And that is something that I don't think has gone unnoticed by the working middle class. I think the working middle class in many countries feels squeezed. And then COVID hits. And at least at first, you know, people were properly frightened about it and whatnot. But, you know, now that it's sort of cleared out and they take a look at all of these unprecedented policy actions that were taken, some of which were probably way overdone and caused a lot of economic harm in the process. Um, and yet the people that have made those decisions don't seem to have suffered any consequences. That, that just adds fuel to the fire, in my opinion, for people that were already concerned that the system was not representing them and their small business, small household, working class uh, interests very well. And there's this growing perception that there is an elite that was simply able to work from home throughout, whereas an awful lot of hardworking people doing very difficult jobs uh, simply did not have that option. So I don't think COVID helped. And, and now, of course, you know, you have this war, which is potentially escalating. And if you really want to get people populist, you know, all you have to do now is reinstate the draft. I mean, gosh, if something like that happens then we're going to see riots in the streets just about anywhere, if you ask me. So I'm not predicting that will happen. I'm just saying that the potential for social unrest in previously stable countries is far higher today than it's been in my lifetime. And all you have to do is look at what happened in Canada. On my word, when the Canadians start to riot, something is badly wrong. Yeah, no, that does tell us something's up. And we, we did see with the Arab Spring, you know, there was a, a spike in food prices, which led to those revolutions. And now basically we're seeing 
the equivalent of the food spike in the Arab Spring, like much broader, larger version of that hitting every single country in the world. So people do really feel a big increase in cost of living and, and that, you know, hurts them in their day-to-day lives. It absolutely does. And this only compounds the central banker's dilemma because as you may recall, in the 1970s, there was this perception in policy circles that it was okay to accommodate the oil shocks and whatnot up to a point, and that that would be you know, okay and would help to take the pressure off the economy and help to avoid a severe recession and whatnot. But by the early 1980s, or already the very late 70s, inflation was simply too high already. It was too high, and it was already leading to social unrest. And so inflation had become a political issue. Ronald Reagan in the U.S. and Margaret Thatcher in the U.K. were both elected in large part because the general working public had simply become so fed up with these high rates of inflation squeezing the cost of living, and they demanded a political solution to that, which was implemented by Paul Volcker at the Fed, among others. And we're starting to end up in a position that looks eerily similar to that, where inflation is becoming not just a political issue, but maybe the political issue that will decide the next election. And if so, that makes life for central bankers extremely difficult, because even Paul Volcker did not have free reign to do what he wanted. And he received tremendous criticism from the U.S. Congress from time to time for doing what he was doing. And anyway, it's going to make their life very, very hard. Yeah, I know you you look at Germany as well, and you've spent time out there. Uh, you know, Germany is an interesting case where they seem to be very reliant on, say, Russian energy, and they're making policy decisions you know, which suggest that they might end their dependence on Russian energy, but not immediately, not right now. So it's something in the future, but not right now. They're obviously the biggest voice in, in Europe. I mean, what do you think is going on there? I think Germany is an extremely difficult position, and it's a position that comes about largely by geography. They do occupy the middle of Europe, and here they really are stuck between uh, the EU, which they have obviously uh, wanted to build into a useful, credible, uniting institution to bring Europe together, and yet on the other hand, The energy input to allow Germany to do that comes from Russia. And so Germany has arguably the most difficult hand to play here. And sometimes sometimes I see the choice as a very, very difficult one without an obvious solution. I will offer a solution in a moment, but first let me describe the dilemma. Germany's economy needs to support the rest of the EU or the EU will not survive in its current form. If Germany goes into a severe prolonged recession, there's no way the EU is going to survive in its current form. It relies too much on the health of the German economy. Of course, that also means the euro itself. I find it hard to believe that Germany is going to be able to endure a period in which the EU economy is in shambles and the ECB just keeps trying to inflate its way out of it. I think that the political culture of Germany will rebel at that at some point and not allow it to proceed in that way, and that may spell the end of the euro. So both the EU in general and the euro specifically are endangered as a result of Germany's precarious position uh, in this conflict. So is there a solution? I think there is, but I think it's an extremely controversial one that does not make me very popular at dinner parties. And basically, it's this. Germany needs to do what France did in the 60s. They need to develop their own independent nuclear force so that Russia will never mess with them. And then they will be able to negotiate with Russia on equal security terms, make sure that Russia does not get overly aggressive in Eastern Europe. And once that is done, they'll be able to continue trading in oil, gas, foodstuffs, metals, you name it with the security that they're never going to be held hostage by Russia ever again in any issue such as this one. Now, the EU will have to play ball with that. They'll have to support Germany going nuclear the way France did in the 60s. But in my opinion, that is the most elegant, if hugely controversial solution to Germany's dilemma, which if not resolved, potentially destroys the euro and the EU. The stakes are high. But don't you think that the US cover gives Germany that credibility in terms of the nuclear, the military capabilities or or not? 
Well, Germany may not be a pawn in the chess game between the United States and Russia. It may be a knight. It may be a bishop, but it's not the queen. And it will be sacrificed if necessary. I don't think that Germany can tolerate that sort of relationship with the United States anymore. That's a fair point. Actually, listening to all of this conversation, I mean, it just sounds really quite frightening in terms of the politics of the next day in the coming few years. Given how high the stakes are, I actually am confident that cooler heads will prevail. Uh, but from where I look right now, from where I sit right now, I'm more frightened than I than I thought I'd be. I actually thought this conflict would have been over very quickly. I thought Russia would have done something very limited. I thought there we'd already be at the negotiating table. It hasn't happened, and that concerns me a great deal. In terms of investors and how they cope in this type of environment, I mean, what would your suggestions be, given that we've had this decades of bond markets rallying and equities doing well and so on, and now we're suddenly in this stagflation environment, high level of geopolitical risk, resource wars, and so on? What would you suggest? investors should do to their portfolio? Well, this is the thing. You have to make the best out of a bad situation. This we're, We are in a capital preservation environment. And when I talk about capital preservation, I mean capital preservation in real inflation, cost of living adjusted terms, because of course the price level is screaming higher as I speak. And so really, uh, I believe we need to not only look at the 70s, but consider the possibility that because the overall debt and leverage in the system is an order of magnitude higher than back in the 70s, that we might end up in an even more severe stagflation prolonged this time around than that time around. And if that's true, then investors need to get aggressively into defensive assets. Now, normally one thinks of bonds as being defensive assets, but in the stagflationary environment, bonds are not uh, defensive assets, unless, of course, they're somehow inflationary. So what you want to do is you want to get into raw commodities and, of course, raw chemicals and fertilizer and things that are – basically, you want to get low on the value chain. This is what I say. These may be very low margin businesses in good times or bad. But the margins will be stable, even in a highly inflationary environment. You can't tell me that a typical sulfuric acid producer is not still going to say, look, this is our operating cost. If we don't get this, we're not going to sell to you. That conversation will still take place in a very, very sort of stagflationary environment. Whereas the tech company trying to sell you their latest gadget, that's going to be one of the first things that is not necessarily going to sell uh, in an inflationary environment because it's highly discretionary. So stay away from intangibles, get light on discretionary assets, just, you know, based on discretionary spending, and retreat into very basic industries with very low margins, perhaps, but at least stable margins that have strong pricing power. That includes, again, commodities, chemicals, uh, you know, things such as that. Of course, gold is super, super, super defensive, but it will not pay a dividend the way other companies will that I just mentioned, you know, basic industries and whatnot. And that's kind of the best you can do. I think that's the best way to try to ride this out. It will at least preserve your capital, if not grow it. And then, of course, look, come on, you know, history goes in cycles. We'll eventually get through this one. It might take a few years. And when we do emerge, then you'll have fresh capital to deploy into more speculative, intangible, you know, longer term, whatever it is, opportunities. But now is not the time, in my opinion, to be doing that. They, they all sound like really reasonable perspectives. And I, I guess, as you said, you know, it's it, best of a bad situation is really the way you have to think about it rather than expecting some easy wins in this type of environment. Indeed, indeed. So that's excellent. I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground, a lot to digest. Thank you a lot for, for all your insights. And, and what's the best way for people to follow your opinions? I do tweet now and again, as many of those of us who you know, hold somewhat alternative views in economics do. And my, my Twitter handle is Butler Gold Revo. One word, Gold Revo is short for my book, The Golden Revolution Revisited which in fact actually touches on some of these topics here regarding especially international monetary relations, but also some of the economic implications of negative supply shocks and whatnot. So that, that's an easy way to follow me and learn more about what I'm up to. Great. Okay, I'll include the Twitter link and also the book link in, in the show notes as well. So with that, it was great chatting to you and, and, and thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you, Bilal. My pleasure. 
Thanks for listening to the episodes. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up to become a member of MacroHive at MacroHive.com. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.